It was more than three years ago that Prime Minister Trudeau said his cabinet was 50 percent women, quote, because it's 2015. The federal government flagged gender equality as an issue it intended to make progress on, particularly in economic terms. Mariam Monsef is Canada's Minister for Women and Gender Equality and the Liberal MP for Peterborough Kawartha. And she joins us now to check on how that's going. Welcome back to TVO. It's good to be back, Steve. I, I'm, I'm not going to pretend for a second that this first question is going to be tough. Okay. Uh, but I know a bit about your background. Okay. And I know a bit about the significance this television station had, actually, <laughs> in your background. That's right. Would you remind people of what it was? Well, I was just telling Diana backstage, actually, that uh, I grew up watching TVO. I was raised by a single mom. and. We couldn't afford cable at the time, but we got TVO. And so whether it was Arthur or Magic School Bus, my sisters and I very much appreciated the good work that folks here at TVO do. I remember you told us that the first time you were here, and I thought, what the heck, let's hear that again. <laughs> you gave a speech recently called Gender Equality an Economic Driver. And I want you to start, if you would, by telling us how you see advancing the economy and gender equality as being linked. There is an opportunity, as I was saying to the good folks at the Economic Club of Canada, uh, there's significant e e uh, opportunities in advancing gender equality in Canada. $150 billion is what our economy will have added to it in eight years if we do this right. The way this will work is, you know better than I, Steve, that we have significant labor shortages in this country. We know that the economy is changing rapidly and those who are most competitive tend to be the ones that are most innovative and have greater diversity. Uh, and so we know also that corporations that have greater diversity around those decision-making tables tend to make better decisions and be more profitable. All of these factors combined make a really strong case for economic growth through gender equality. Well, what you just said makes sense on the face of it, but of course we're into empirically provable facts here. So how do you know that it, being more inclusive at decision-making levels in the C-suites and so on on boards, how do you know that makes companies better? Well, this is evidence-based. Okay. So uh, a report by McKinsey, for example, talks about how $150 billion in incremental GDP will be added to our economy by 2026. We know that organizations that have 30% or more women tend to have a stronger bottom line. We know that corporations whose boards have more diversity, including more women, tend to have better decision-making abilities and also be stronger. And so this is backed up by a significant uh, evidence uh, base, uh, a significant base of evidence. Mm -hmm. We also know that there's a cost to gender inequality. Um, we've heard about uh, the courageous, uh, through the courageous uh, silence breakers that have come out with the Time's Up and Me Too conversations. We know that gender inequality includes gender-based violence. We mm -hmm. know that gender-based violence costs Canada's economy. If you just focus on sexual violence and domestic violence alone, over $12 billion a year. And so when we prevent gender-based violence, we also have opportunities to save money. Let's go back to the corporate world for a second. If it makes so much sense on the face of it to do this because it would uh, unleash all of this economic activity, what's stopping it from happening? I believe this is a change whose time has come and smart employers are beginning to do the work and leading, in fact. We're seeing smart employers asking the right questions. We're asking them shine light on the pay inequities that exist within their own companies. They know that if they have the right programs and policies in place, that they're more likely to attract and retain the very best talent there is, and that's how they'll stay competitive. So the change is upon us, and those who understand the value are already ahead of the curve. But uh, Okay, let me hit it on the head harder then. It, it... Are there not enough women on boards and in senior positions in the business world because men want to hog all the power for themselves? There are a lot of reasons why... Is that one of them? There isn't enough. I believe that more and more men are also asking questions about why these inequities exist. They're wondering why their sisters and mothers, their colleagues and their daughters are experiencing inequality. 
part of the reason, uh, and we certainly see it in the world of politics, is women are less likely to, to believe that they are the right person for the job. You, if you're thinking about asking a woman to run, you have to ask her 14 times before she's like, yeah, I can do this. So part of it is the championing and the encouragement that happens. Part of it is uh, that inclusive uh, workplace uh, hasn't always been there. Those, those decision-making tables where power and influence is exercised haven't always been welcoming to those who don't necessarily belong. Uh, but those changes are happening too because I, more and more decision makers are seeing that when that diversity is there, they make better decisions. I, I wanted to know whether you're being facetious there, but because I've heard that before as well. When it comes to politics, ask a guy once, will you run for us? They say yes, or they make a decision right away. You do have to ask, I mean, I have heard that you have to ask women occasionally a dozen times before yeah. they... That is true? Absolutely, absolutely. I, took 14 asks to get me to run. We have introduced a new appointment process. So we, back to your question, Steve, uh, why hasn't this happened? It takes leadership. It takes significant leadership. And so when the prime minister uh, formed government, he said, we're going to change the way we make appointments at the federal level beyond the gender balance cabinet, which you referenced. We're also changing the way that we are appointing senators and people to different boards and agencies. We decided to ensure that more women and more people of diverse backgrounds and experiences have opportunities to be part of this process. One of the realities we're seeing is it's 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 challenging to get mm. more women and people who haven't traditionally been at these tables of power to put their names forward, that it takes a few extra asks to get them mm. to get there. But once they do, they add a world uh, of expertise and knowledge uh, and make the functioning and the results of those decision-making bodies better. Well, here's the state of play right now. Can we bring these numbers up, please? This is um, from Catalyst, who has, um, I guess, compiled these numbers on the state of women on corporate boards. Women apparently held less than a quarter of the FP500, that's the Financial Post 500 directorships in 2017. That's only a one percentage point increase from the directorships in 2016. Almost half of directors reporting said that their board had a target for increasing women on boards in 2017. That's up almost 10 percentage points from 2016. <clears throat> of the 677 companies on the TSX, 45%, that's nearly half, had zero women in 2016. In 2017, just under a quarter of the 715 board seats on the TSX 60 were held by women, under a quarter. What leaps off the page for you among those numbers? Firstly, a great deal of gratitude for organizations like Catalyst and so many like them who have been talking about this and collecting the body of evidence to continue the conversation and the action on this. We wouldn't be here in this moment talking to folks like the Economic Club of Canada about gender equality uh, and seeing it as an economic driver without them. It's clear that while there is uh, some progress made, that we have a long way to go. Uh, and surely in Canada, we're capable of better, that we're capable of equal. Uh, we've introduced new legislation, as you know. Bill C-25 is now law of the land, and it introduce, uh, introduces a comply or explain mm -hmm. model for having greater diversity on corporate boards in Canada because we want them to be more competitive. You know there are countries in this world, though, that go beyond that. They don't, Absolutely. They don't, they, they don't just say, you know, comply or explain. What, sorry, what was the expression again? Yeah. Comply or explain? They say quota. You have to hit X number, whatever it is, 25, 50 percent, uh, or else. Should Canada go there? Well, minister Baines has talked about this before. He's the minister responsible for introducing this really important bill. He said, we're going to introduce comply or explain. We're going to work with corporations to help them get there. If this doesn't work, then we're going to have to consider other options like quotas. We're seeing some progress, as you showed earlier. Uh, and we also know that those corporations, uh, those corporate boards, actually end up hiring other executive positions, like CEOs. We know that in Canada, less than 5% of CEOs are women. So it's hard not to see the correlation between the, 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 the less diversity you see on a, on a corporate board the fewer uh, women and diverse leaders we're going to see in the executive suite. So we have a long way to go, but these corporations can rest assured that our government wants to work with them. We want to see them succeed because their success is Canada's success. And one of the ways we're doing that is through the comply or explain model. But if we don't get more 
progress as you see it in this area, you would consider quotas. The government would consider. We would that. have to consider. We would have to consider other options, mostly because this is all about a competition that Canada's in in this rapidly changing economy. Our companies, our businesses, are not as competitive as they can be in this global market if they don't have all the best talent around the table. And when we're leaving talent out of the room, we're leaving money on the table, and that's hurting all of us. Well, here's another example. We shouldn't leave people with the impression that this is just a story in the C-suite, you know. There was a, a study done by the Brookfield Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship found that women in Canadian tech jobs with a bachelor's degree or right. higher earn about $20,000 annually less than men with the same degree in the same profession. Any idea why that is? Well, firstly, we know that there is a significant labor shortage in the tech mm -hmm. sector. Women make up about 30% of those there. We know that in places like Manitoba, for example, 1,500 jobs in this sector go unfilled every year. These are great middle class jobs with salaries starting at around $46,000. That's money that people aren't earning and spending. And that's productivity that companies aren't seeing. And there is a range of reasons for why this pay inequity exists. Um, there is uh, certainly in fields like STEM fields and tech, um, they have traditionally been male dominated. Uh, we know that uh, there is discrimination in workplaces. We know that there is less likelihood for women to negotiate equal pay or greater salaries, but we also know that those sectors are working hard to do better, uh, and that's where I see hope. We're partnering with organizations in places like Manitoba. We're working uh, on a project called MAVEN. We're partnering with them for three years so that they, as a community of leaders who are working to drive the tech sector and ensure that it remains competitive and mm. in their province, we're working with them to support them to find out what are the barriers and what is a blueprint that we can come up with on our own for our own sector to ensure that we attract and retain the very best talent. But what do you think is going on here? Is it more? Th is it more that male-dominated businesses just don't want to pay women equally, or is it apropos of what you said earlier? Uh, maybe some women are afraid to ask for a salary comparable to what their male colleagues are getting. Um, I want to put very little of this on women themselves because we are in the midst of a shift. So mm -hmm. generally, when it comes to the gender wage gap, there are a number of reasons. Firstly, uh, when you look at pay inequity, we don't always value the work of women the same way that we value the work of men. That's mean, unfortunate as a society, as a society, but we're changing that. We're adding legislation like proactive pay equity, uh, but we're also having different conversations about the value of that work. Another reason for it is women are more likely to provide the care for their loved ones, for their family members, whether it's their children or their parents or their in-laws, which we're seeing more and more of. We also know that uh, those, those care responsibilities can often lead to part-time work, uh, not by choice, though some choose to do that, but sometimes because they have no other options. Uh, that discrimination uh, is real. And the attitudes that we're talking about, the behaviors uh, are slowly shifting. Uh, we also know that those companies that have better policies and better HR practices, those smarter employers, are actually doing a really good job at closing that wage gap and really leading the way. Okay. Let's talk about the Prime Minister's favorite F word, shall we? Feminism? Let's, yeah. Feminism, here we go. You read McLean's magazine. I of course do. you do. You wrote a column for them recently. Uh, they have been having a, a, an interesting debate about um, who gets to call themselves a feminist these days. And, um, well, let's get into this. How, just give me your, your basic 20-second definition of what you believe feminism is. Look, my feminism is about ensuring that everyone, regardless of gender or background, has equal opportunity to participate in the place that they call home and in society. Uh, it's about making sure that women have choices when it comes to their reproductive rights, to their economic options, to their democratic participation and other leadership opportunities. Okay, that definition, you, look, this is not news to you, you've heard this before. The definition the way you just gave it has prompted some conservatives, particularly those who may be pro-life as opposed to pro-choice, has prompted them to say they don't feel included in your definition of feminism. Is that f fair criticism? 
feminism is a big wide tent. It's part of a movement. But it doesn't movement. include pro-life people, apparently. If you are working to advance gender equality, uh, and I believe this, and our government will always stand up for a woman's right to choose. Uh, if you don't have the right to choose how to, when to reproduce or not, uh, you have fewer choices in life uh, as a whole. And that affects your economic, social, emotional, psychological well-being. Uh, I believe that equality is uh, driven by a movement that has existed long before any of us got here, a movement that's at its best when it's inclusive. And if I may, uh, Steve, what gets under my skin, what really gets under my skin, is those who seek to divide this movement that is at such a critical juncture in its history that is making significant progress. People who choose to question a woman's right to choose. People who have squandered opportunities to advance gender okay, equality. But Minister, they, they're saying you're the one being exclusionary. You want a big tent in which all feminists can coexist, but we don't want the social conservative pro-life people in that big tent of feminism. That's what they say your definition of feminism is, which is exclusionary. They're not right? If you want to help advance women and people of gender back, diverse gender backgrounds in this country and around the world, if you want to open uh, economic routes and remove barriers to their equal participation, this is a movement in which not only we all have a place in, but have a responsibility to be a part of. Can you be a conservative and a feminist at the same time? I believe it's possible. Yes, it's yes. We've seen we've seen conservatives uh, who have done great work. Uh, we have a former prime minister, the right honourable Kim Campbell, who's done amazing work. We have conservatives in my own community in Peterborough, Kawartha, who are advancing gender equality each and every day. Uh, gender equality is not about politics. It's about doing the right thing and growing the economy. And it takes all of us across party stripes, across sectors, across generations to move ahead. Okay, well, uh, let's do one more topic here, and that is, uh, you know, we've been calling ourselves the province's education station for a long time, and so we're very interested in education K to the end of post-secondary, and I know that you recently uh, sort of started to draft plans for a national framework to combat sexual violence in post-secondary institutions. What's the status of that right now? We heard from parents and grandparents, students, and frontline service providers that there is currently a hodgepodge of policies and programs available to prevent gender-based violence on campus and to provide support to survivors when they need it and to do the investigations required when allegations come forward. So we were asked to provide leadership and we've stepped in. I'm so thankful to be working with uh, two of Canada's leading experts in this area. Farah Khan and CJ Rowe have brought together an advisory council made up of frontline service providers, lawyers, presidents of universities, labor groups, and student leaders themselves from various regional and uh, other diverse backgrounds to help us develop a framework so that as a Canadian, no matter where you choose to work or study, which campus in this country, you will find a basic level of support and policies to ensure that you are as safe as you can possibly be on these campuses. The group has begun its work. I was there for their inaugural meeting in Montreal last week, uh, and they will be drafting the framework and providing us their report in May. I don't want to get too uh, nerdy BNA Act section Please 91, be, be 92 my, on you here. Guest. But, I mean, post secondary is a provincial responsibility in our Constitution, so why do you have a role in this at all? Well, this is a Canadian issue. Uh, whether you're studying as a student in Ontario from Alberta or coming to uh, Trent University, which is in my backyard, you have the fundamental right to live free of violence and harassment and to have that safety. Parents expect it when they send their kids off to school and students expect it as they move into the significant uh, rite of passage. Uh, we are also working with provinces and territories uh, on implementing a gender-based violence strategy that we developed together and that we introduced in 2017. We are not interested in duplicating efforts. We're, we're simply interested in going in, 
filling in the gaps where they exist, and enhancing best practices wherever we find them. Minister, I've got one more question for you. Uh, please complete the following sentence. Okay. My time as the Minister for Women and Gender Equality will be considered successful if what? If we ensure the sustainability of the movement that got us here. Period, full stop. Gotcha. Maria Monsef is the Minister for Women and Gender Equality. She's the Member of Parliament for Peterborough Kawartha, and we always appreciate your visits to our studio. Thanks so much. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.